Subcommittee on Highways and Transit will come to order. I ask unanimous consent that the chairman be authorized to declare a recess at any time during today's hearing without objection so ordered. Also ask unanimous consent that members not on the subcommittee be permitted to sit with the subcommittee at today's hearing and ask questions without objection so ordered. As a reminder, if members wish to insert a document into the record, please also email it to documentsti at mail.house.gov. I now recognize myself for the purpose of an opening statement. Good morning, and I want to welcome our witnesses today. Thank you all for being here. We are here to better understand the Biden administration's implementation of Buy America, including those provisions that were in the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, or IJA. As most of us here know, I've forcefully supported U.S. manufacturing and our domestic steel industry for many years, and I'm proud to serve as the Republican co-chair of the Congressional Steel Caucus. I'm particularly pleased to have a great steel company, Nucor, which has significant investments in my home state of Arkansas, here with us today. Buy America policy supports and strengthens our domestic manufacturing economy, which is crucial for both our national prosperity and security. Enforcing Buy America requirements ensures that taxpayer dollars are spent here in the United States and not enriching our foreign adversaries, such as the Chinese Communist Party. For example, in 2019, I led congressional efforts to pass the Transit Infrastructure Vehicle Security Act, or TIVSA, which has included, which, uh, included as part of the National Defense Authorization Act of 2020. This law prohibits the use of federal funds to purchase rolling stock, buses, and rail cars from Chinese-owned or Chinese-domiciled manufacturers. Unfortunately, codification of the TIVSA and its prohibition on purchasing transit equipment from China did not send a clear enough message to the Federal Transit Administration. The FTA determined that transit agencies which had formed contracts with restricted manufacturers, including the state-owned China Railway Rolling Stock MA Corporation, prior to December 2019, would be granted a lifetime exemption from the procurement prohibitions enacted by law. We are presently working to fix that loophole. Earlier this Congress, the committee marked up and passed my bipartisan bill, H.R. 3317, the Rolling Stock Protection Act, to firmly and finally put an end to the practice of sending American taxpayer dollars to Chinese-based manufacturers of rail cars and buses. The recent committee passage of the Rolling Stock Protection Act is just one example of the longstanding bipartisan work of this committee to ensure that Buy America policies are effective. Buy America is not new to the transportation sector. The first provisions date back to the Buy America Act of 1933, which is the first federal law to require domestic sourcing preferences for items purchased with federal funds. The Surface Transportation Assistance Act, or Assistance Act of uh, 1982, or STAY, expanded Buy America provisions and stipulated that funds authorized for federal aid highway projects, including transit, rail, and road transportation, cannot be obligated unless the steel cement and manufactured products used are pro produced in the United States. Stay also directed that the Federal Highway Administration, FHWA, to develop its Buy America waiver procedures to provide procurement requ uh, requirement relief for grant recipients under specific circumstances. One such waiver affirmed in a 1983 FHWA final rule exempted all manufactured products other than steel and cement from Buy America provisions. However, this manufactured products waiver, which has been in place for 40 years, is now under review by the Biden administration as required by IJA. During the public comment period on the waiver's review, the administration received more than 7,500 comments from stakeholders, and I hope that our witnesses today will share their thoughts on this important and pending process. While I may not adamantly support everything IJA did, one thing it made very clear was that Buy America was critical. For example, IJA expanded Buy America provisions to federally funded projects that had previously been exempt including transmission facilities, electric facility structures, broadband infrastructure, and real property and buildings. IJA also included the Build America, Buy America Act, which expanded domestic production preference for construction materials in addition to iron, steel, and manufactured products, and extended those requirements to all infrastructure projects that receive federal funding, not just those authorized in the bill. Further, IJA created the Made in America Office as part of the Office of Management and Budget to provide and enforce compliance guidance and evaluate waiver requests for project applicants seeking exemptions under specific circumstances. That said, since the enactment of IJA, this committee has continued to receive testimony raising concerns about the implementation of Buy America. For example, despite direct legislative language, the Biden administration took 15 months to publish final guidance on Buy America implementation and compliance. To add to the confusion, during that same time frame, U.S. Department of Transportation, or DOT, was advancing its own waiver and exemption process guidance for grantees and uh, funding applicants, which included the issuance of waiver for all Buy America requirements for construction materials 
for awards obligated over a 180-day period. The contradictory guidance put forward by the Biden administration on Buy America waivers continues to cause project delays and regrettably leads to cost increases for the businesses that build our roads and bridges, as well as operate the equipment in our transportation network. States and industry need clear guidelines, including an understanding of what is and is not required when applying for a waiver so that we can continue constructing a modern and efficient transportation system reliant on American manufacturing. Our witnesses will offer their perspectives on the continued implementation of Buy America and the opportunities to continue growing and supporting domestic manufacturing. Again, I thank them for appearing before us today. I now recognize Ranking Member Holmes Norton for five minutes for an opening statement. I would like to thank uh, Subcommittee Chair Rick Crawford for holding this hearing on the impl implementation of, of Buy America provisions. Buy America is a foundational policy for our highway and transit programs and for U.S. workers. These policies date back to the late 1970s and, and have ensured that as states, localities, and transit agencies build projects, they are also supporting U.S. jobs and domestic supply chains. Buy America ensures that taxpayers see double the benefit in transportation projects. First, they see the safety or mobility benefits of the projects. Second, the projects are built with American products, creating good paying jobs for workers. While the federal highway and transit programs have benefited from Buy America policies for over 45 years, that is not true for every federal infrastructure program. The passage of the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act changed that. The law included the Build America, Buy America Act, a cornerstone of the Biden administration's industrial policy. The law extended domestic content requirements to all federally funded infrastructure programs. While highway and transit programs already included most of these requirements, the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act expanded Buy America to also cover construction materials. This is a new policy for the federal highway and transit programs. Congress and the Biden administration must provide state departments of transportation and transit agencies with the resources they need to understand and comply with the new requirements. Another recent change in the Biden administration's policy, uh, increasing by American standards for electric vehicle charges. These new standards will help us bring an emerging manufacturing sector to the United States while also helping to reduce pollution in our communities. I was pleased that President Biden vetoed the effort to overturn the increased standards for vehicle, electric vehicle charges, and that these new, stronger Buy America standards will stay on the books. I also look forward to hearing from our witnesses uh, about the Buy America waiver process. While Buy America waivers should be used judiciously, there are instances in which infrastructure projects may require materials or products not made in the United States. In those instances, the waiver process should be fair and transparent to stakeholders. Finally, I would be remiss not to mention this committee's role in banning federal transit funds uh, from being used to purchase transit rolling stock from Chinese state owned enterprises. That is particularly, that is a particularly critical pol policy here in the national capital region, home to much of the country's intelligence and national security apparatus. I appreciate the bipartisan work of my colleagues to confront that challenge. I thank our witnesses for being here today and I look forward to working with you to improve and strengthen our nation's Buy America policies. Thank you, Mrs. Chairman. I thank the ranking member. I now recognize the ranking member of the full committee for one minute, actually five minutes, <laughs> for any comments. Here, let me race through this then. 
Thank you, Chair and Ranking Member, <clears throat> for holding this hearing. And uh, today's hearing focuses on the implementation of the Buy American policy. And I want to thank all the witnesses for being here today and for all your efforts to create jobs and strengthen the U.S. manufacturing sector. The subcommittee has jurisdiction over several agencies that have decades of experience, experience implementing Buy America policies. The Federal Highway Administration and Federal Transit Administration both were directed by Congress in the 70s and 80s to enforce domestic content requirements on projects that use federal funds. Since their enactment, these requirements have been updated to respond to various issues facing the U.S. economy. Broadly speaking, current Buy America policies ensure that federally funded transit, rail, and road transportation projects cannot be built unless the iron, steel, manufactured, manufactured products and certain construction materials used in those projects are produced in the U.S. The intent of these policies is to maximize the economic value of federal investment uh, infrastructure investments in the U.S. and ensure taxpayer dollars benefit our workers and companies. Under the leadership of this administration, Democrats are taking a proactive and strategic approach to create jobs and strengthen the U.S. industrial base. The bipartisan infrastructure law delivered historic investments to upgrade the nation's infrastructure and expanded domestic procurement policies through the Build America Buy America Act provisions in the BIL. The law expanded Buy America coverage to all federally funded infrastructure projects, including those that had previously been exempt. And by requiring the use of products and materials made in the U.S., the Build America Buy America provisions have helped stimulate private sector investment in domestic manufacturing, bolster critical supply chains, and support the creation of good jobs so that America's workers and industries can compete and lead globally. Since the Biden administration took office, the economy has added nearly 800,000 manufacturing jobs, and real manufacturing construction spending in the U.S. has doubled since the enactment of the um, bipartisan infrastructure law. And the surge comes from the trio of policy achievements enacted in the last Congress, the BIL, the Inflation Reduction Act, and the Chips and Science Act. These laws expanded by America provisions and provided dedicated funding and incentives to encourage private investment in our economy. This public spending has not crowded out private spending. Real private spending on transportation construction has grown by nearly 14% since the President signed the BIL. Now, following the enactment, this administration has faced several competing priorities, including getting this historic funding out quickly and efficiently, an issue this uh, full committee has, has, has analyzed and will continue to analyze, while applying new and expanded domestic content requirements to infrastructure projects. The administration has made clear that it has a commitment to Buy America and enforcing these requirements as soon as practically possible. Additionally, the Biden administration is committed to using waivers from Buy America in a limited and strategic manner. In the past, broad and permanent waivers have diluted the potential benefits of Buy America policies and a lack of targeted waivers, even when warranted, delayed critical infrastructure projects. Waivers, when issued appropriately, are a tool to signal where gaps exist in the domestic supply chain or allow time for compliance with stronger Buy America standards. Temporary and targeted waivers send clear market signals allowing for a phase-in of domestic procurement preferences, which create an incentive for firms to invest in the U.S. and create good jobs in our communities. For example, EV charges were previously largely exempt from Buy America under, the, under a 1983 general waiver for manufactured products. Although not required to do so by law, the administration extended Buy America coverage to EV chargers under a phased-in implementation plan to give private sector companies in the U.S. time to adjust their supply chains. This policy, which will be fully in effect in July, is already spurring hundreds of millions of dollars of factory investments and jobs for domestic EV charger production. Failed attempts to repeal the standard would have resulted in EV chargers again being exempt from Buy America resulting in taxpayer dollars going to overseas companies. So I'm pleased the President had vetoed this bad idea and instead honored his commitment to our workers and manufacturers. And yet I do continue to welcome the opportunity to celebrate our infrastructure benefits that each of our districts and constituents are reaping because of the BIL. The committee continues to delivering bipartisan solutions for all Americans and Buy America continues to enjoy broad bipartisan support. I look forward to today's discussion. That I yield back. Gentlemen, just, yields. just under a minute. <laughs> I'd like, now like to welcome our witnesses and thank them for being here today. Mr. Carlos Braceres, Executive Director of the Utah Department of Transportation, on behalf of the American Association of State Highway and Transportation Officials, 
Mr. Ty Edmondson, CEO of the TA Loving Company on behalf of the Associated General Contractors of America. <coughs> Mr. Dan Needham, Executive Vice President at Nucor Corporation. Uh, Mr. Brian Enders, Vice President of Walbeck Group on behalf of the National Asphalt Pavement Association. And Ms. Megan Salran, Legislative Representative for the United Steel Workers. Briefly, I'd like to take a minute to explain our lighting system to our witnesses. It seems pretty self-explanatory. There are three lights in front of you. Green means go, but unlike a stoplight, yellow does not mean proceed with caution, as you might <laughs> expect. It means kick it into high gear because you're fixing to run out of time. And red will indicate that your time has concluded and would ask you to conclude your remarks. Uh, you might hear a little tap of the gavel um, just to remind you in case you exceed that five minute mark. So when it turns red, just be advised. Um, and I ask unanimous consent that the witnesses' full statements be included in the record without objection so ordered. I ask unanimous consent that the record of today's hearing remain open until such time as our witnesses have provided any answers to any questions that may have been submitted to them in writing without objection so ordered. Oscar, also ask unanimous consent that the record remain open for 15 additional days for comments and any information submitted by members or witnesses to be included in the record of today's hearing without objection so ordered. As your written testimony has been made part of the record, the subcommittee asks that you limit your oral remarks to five minutes. Before our first witness, Mr. Braceros, gives testimony, I'd like to recognize Representative Owens to give a short introduction. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, as I introduce my good friend, Ms. Carlos Braceros, I'd like to take a few minutes to, uh, I think it's very relevant to take a minute to brag on the state that we both serve. Uh, Utah is a relatively small state, but we definitely push, push above our weight in so many ways. The fastest growing state in the Union since 2020, one of the fastest growing states in recovering from the economy uh, from the COVID, most collaborative between state, federal, and, and uh, local, extremely innovative because of our entrepreneurial uh, uh, culture. We're the state that balances our budget every single year. We have a state-of-the-art airports, uh, international, regional. We're building an inland port that expands the length of our state, which will make Utah the distribution hub of the West. We are recently selected as a site for the 2034 Winter Olympics. Just this morning, I read uh, that of the 400 uh, cities ranked by Milken Institute, Salt Lake City, Provo, Orem, St. George, ranking the top four of the best performing cities in, this, in the nation. At the heart of this smart growth is a vision of the Utah's Department of Edu uh, Transportation, UDOT. At the head of UDOT is Mr. Carlos Braceros. Carlos joined the Utah Department of Transportation in 1986 and was appointed executive director in 2013. In this capacity, he is responsible for UDOT's 1,600 um, employees and with the design, construction, and maintenance of Utah's 6,000 miles of uh, roads and highways. Under Carlos's leadership, UDOT continues to rise to the challenge of our state's beautiful yet unique ge ge geography and our explosive um, population growth. He's used innovation and creativity to complete major highways expansions in record time. In addition to his responsibility at UDOT, UDOT, Carlos also chairs the ASHTO Agency Administration Management Committee, which he was a past president. UDOT continues to represent what I call the Utah way, which, which is to lead. And Carlos, I look forward to you. Members of the Highway and Transportation Subcommittee are hearing your remarks and insight on innovative work you've been doing back home. Welcome. <clears throat> With that, Mr. Braceros, you are recognized for five minutes. Chair Crawford. Ranking Member Norton and members of the subcommittee, thank you for holding today's hearing on Build America by America. I'm Carlos Braceros, and I serve as Executive Director of the Utah Department of Transportation. I'm also on the AASHTO board, including serving as AASHTO's president in 2018 to 2019. I want to thank this subcommittee for your leadership on surface transportation issues that ultimately led to the enactment of the IIJA. State DOTs have recognized since day one of IJF that the delivery of this historic investment is paramount. American money should be spent on American stuff to benefit Americans. But at the end of the day, the true benefit is realized through projects that we deliver to save lives and make, life, make lives better. ASTO and the state DOT strongly support the goal to increase American manufacturing capacity by creating new domestic jobs and encouraging economic growth. However, we also recognize this transformation cannot occur overnight or with a flip of a switch. When I'm trying to do something really big, I usually find it more effective to break it down into pieces. I think we'll be able to meet our shared goals of building the American manufacturer base if we can remember Pareto's law. Focus on what constitutes 80% of the value of projects being used in transportation. 
No, this does not mean that we forget about the other 20%. But recognize, we are jumping on a very fast moving train. Our transportation projects are moving forward quickly. For more than 40 years, Buy America statutes have required domestic manufacturing pro processes for iron, steel, and certain manufactured products permanently incorporated into the federal highway and transit projects. I just significantly expanded coverage to five categories of construction materials. With the 2024 transportation construction season on the horizon, state DOTs are experiencing delays due to supply chain issues, material availability, and yes, continued worker shortages. Now, while construction projects are accustomed to dealing with complex realities, we're seeing further delays as part of the industry effort to comply with BABA. While ASTO understands the difficult nature of implementing new BABA requirements across the entire federal government, it's important to recognize the disruption that occurs as results of changes to previously issued guidance. Programming projects is like a symphony. So some major changes to one single project can have a cascading effect on timing and resource allocations to very many projects. Also, state DOTs expend a significant effort to change specifications, quality assurance, and other documentation and to train DOT employees, consultants, and contractors on how to comply with guidance. Consistency in guidance will make our teams more effective and efficient. I wanna highlight the importance of a timely and transparent waiver process. Currently, many states would like to see improvements in several areas. The time it takes for a waiver to be processed, the level of effort and time required to develop a waiver, and clearer guidance on what the required documentation is. I wanna note that for manufactured products, we've been operating under the Federal Highway Public Interest Waiver of general applicability since 1983. Federal Highway is currently considering termination of this waiver, which would represent an extreme challenge to, for state DOTs and for manufacturers. We agree with the 2013 Federal Highway determination that rescinded the waiver, uh, that rescinding the waiver would not have a significant impact on American manufacturing because manufactured products comprise a small percentage of the cost for the highway construction program, which also means it's a small share of the market for manufacturers. In other words, the benefits are likely to be limited and the cost to schedules and budgets significant. If there's one thing I hope you'll take away from my testimony, it's the importance of keeping the 1983 Federal Highway Waiver of General Applicability in place. To close, we firmly believe that a deliberative practitioner-informed process between government and industry should continue to guide implementation of Build America by America. This will ensure timely, cost-effective investments, successful delivery of critical transportation infrastructure projects funded through IGEM. Thank you for the opportunity to provide testimony at this hearing, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Mr. Braceres. I'll now recognize Mr. Edmondson for five minutes. Chairman Crawford, Ranking Member Norton and members of the Subcommittee on Highway and Transit, thank you for inviting me to testify on this vitally important topic. My name is Ty Edmondson and I am the CEO and President of TA Loving Company and a board member of the Associated General Contractors of America, where I serve as Chair of the Utility Infrastructure Division. TA Loving Company was founded in Goldsboro, North Carolina in 1925. Today, the company employs more than 400 construction professionals who work on transportation, water, education, health care, and other essential facilities and civil infrastructure projects. In my testimony today, I will discuss the implementation of the Build America, Buy America Act as it relates to the construction industry. Before I continue, I want to be clear. I am not here today to debate the merit, merits of Buy America. I, along with AGC, support the efforts to expand domestic manufacturing capabilities. In addition, I'd like to mention that the challenges I will be discussing today mostly do not pertain to iron and steel materials, as similar requirements for such product, products date back decades. The IIJA expanded coverage to construction materials and task the OMB with providing guidance to the industry stakeholders and to be the ultimate decision maker for waivers. So what does all this mean for construction companies bidding on a road project? After the state DOT opens a project for bidding, construction companies work to put together a proposal. <clears throat> 
we reach out to the suppliers to get estimates for, various, for the various materials. Since we are ultimately responsible, we ask for what they refer to as a Buy America certification letter that guarantees to the contractor that these materials are compliant. Since the passage of IIJA, we have asked, asked suppliers for certification letters and instead, and, and instead get asterisks on their quotes saying they cannot certify compliance. This is particularly prevalent with manufactured products such as permanent traffic management and safety equipment. Put simply, there is uncertainty. In construction, that means increased costs because contractors have to account for that in their bids to mitigate risk. How can an individual contractor be expected to adhere to rules and regulations when it's a moving target? Such situations are especially challenging for smaller companies like a DBE who lack the resources of a larger company. Currently, my company is having difficulty sourcing the following materials and products among others. Geotextiles, LED lighting, electrical components, signal cabinets, generators, pumps, motors, UV disinfection equipment, PFAS treatment systems, and media. Historically, the waiver process has not been transparent or efficient. For example, a waiver request for the Illinois DOT for non-domestic pumps took more than two years to be posted for public comment and allow a manufacturer to respond that they have the compliant prod product. Unfortunately, cases such as these are not isolated instances and result in unintended consequences such as project delays, material substitutions, project redesigns, or contractors opting not to bid on a project. With OMB's latest memorandum, a federal agency must also consult with the OMB on the waiver scope prior to public comment and after the comment period ends to have the OMB make the final decision. This is akin to, to requiring a local school district to contact the Department of Education twice to approve a child's absence note to verify that the child can return to school. The requirement also adds unnecessarily, unnecessary political pressure. Bef because of these concerns, AGC and other stakeholders filed a formal request for rulemaking today. We are urging the White House to drop its current approach to the waiver process and focus on implementing the requirements at a higher level and empower federal agencies with broad discretion to fill in the details for projects they understand best. I thank the subcommittee for the opportunity to testify today and look forward to answering any questions you may have. Thank you, Mr. Edmondson. I recognize Mr. Needham for five minutes. Chairman Crawford and members of the subcommittee, on behalf of Nucor Corporation and our 32,000 teammates, thank you for the opportunity to be here today. I am Dan Needham, Executive Vice President of Commercial. I've been with Nucor since 2000 and in my current position since 2021. Buy America and other domestic preference laws are vital to the American steel industry. We thank the committee for ensuring that they re remain robust and effective. Nucor is the largest and most diversified steel producer in the United States and the largest recycler of any material anywhere in the Western Hemisphere. We are one of the safest steel companies in the world with a 2023 injury and illness rate that was less than 30% of the industry average. Nucor is also a leader in sustainable steel making producing steel using up to 100% recycled content. Our greenhouse gas intensity is 60% lower than the global average, and we aim to achieve net zero greenhouse gas emissions by 2050. Nucor continues to expand and improve our operations to ensure we can meet the needs of American infrastructure. Since 2020, we have invested more than 12 billion to ensure that we can produce a steel needed for any project anywhere. Recent investments include a state-of-the-art cut-to-length plate mill in Brandenburg, Kentucky, which produces plate for military, transportation, and energy applications, including offshore wind monopile foundations. We are the only steel producer in North America 
capable of producing the steel for these offshore wind monopile foundations. We are also expanding capacity in traditional product lines, including at a new rebar micro mill in Lexington, North Carolina. Strong Buy America provisions are critical to these investments. Nucor firmly believes that investing in infrastructure ensures American safety and competitiveness and supports the resurgence of American manufacturing that we have seen in recent years. When implemented effectively, Buy America requirements encourage investment and innovation, create stable and high wage American jobs, and help keep high emission and unfairly traded foreign steel out of US infrastructure. We have been encouraged by recent efforts to expand and strengthen domestic iron and steel requirements, whether through the Build America, Buy America Act, or the IRA. BABA's provisions require uniform application of Buy America requirements with the melted and poured standard for iron and steel that agencies like the Federal Highway Administration and the Federal Transit Administration have implemented for more than 40 years. These Buy America programs are readily available models for other agencies to follow as they implement BABA. As energy and infrastructure investments under the infrastructure law and IRA drive as much as 8 million tons of additional steel demand, robust and consistent Buy America provisions are as critical as ever. Nucor strongly supports recent improvements, but is carefully watching certain aspects of implementation. First, as detailed in my written statement for the record, de minimis content or minor component waivers could result in significant volumes of high value steel products being unreasonably exempted. In August of last year, for example, DOT increased most of its de minimis content thresholds, which weakens existing Buy America programs and is inconsistent with BABA's goal of maximizing the use of American made goods in our nation's infrastructure. Other agencies have proposed or implemented new waivers that would exempt so-called minor components from Buy America requirements. These waivers could exempt sophisticated steel products like fasteners, which are a critical product line for Nucor. We appreciate DOT's decision not to move forward with the minor components waiver and hope other agencies follow suit. The most effective Buy America requirements are simple and straightforward. FHWA's Buy America program is probably the gold standard. It requires all iron and steel to be produced in the United States, period. There are no loopholes and no ambiguity. As the Federal Highway Administration reviews its nationwide waiver for manufactured products, it should maintain its longstanding policy that all steel be produced in the United States, including the steel contained in manufactured products. FTA and other agencies should implement the same standard. We thank this subcommittee and welcome the opportunity to work with you on effective Buy America implementation. Thank you, Mr. Nita. Mr. Anders, you're recognized for five minutes. Ranking Member Larson, Highways Subcommittee, Chairman Crawford, Ranking Member Norton, and members of the committee, thank you for inviting me today to discuss lessons learned from the Buy America provisions via the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act. My name is Brian Enders, Vice President of the Wallback Group, a construction company employing over 2,000 hardworking men and women throughout the upper Midwest. Wallbeck is a vertically integrated organization of six companies that produce high quality construction materials along with design, engineering, and construction services. I was raised in Leona, a small town in Northern Wisconsin. I started my career as an intern at Walbeck and over the last 20 years grew into my current role. I serve on boards of the Wisconsin Asphalt Pavement Association and National Asphalt Pavement Association. I am also the chair of the National Center for Asphalt Technology at Auburn University, which continually improves our product through science. I am proud to join you on behalf of the National Asphalt Pavement Association. It is vital to understand the many contributions of asphalt to our surface transportation network. Almost 95% of roads in the U.S. are surfaced with asphalt, including 65% of the interstate system. Almost 80% of airport runways are surfaced with asphalt. If you wonder what asphalt pavement really is, essentially it consists of two primary materials, 
aggregate, which is the stone, sand, and gravel that form the base, and asphalt binder, a specific refined oil product that serves as the glue bonding the aggregates together. Asphalt pavement contains about 95% aggregate and 5% binder. It can be designed for specific project requirements like traffic volumes and climate conditions, while remaining cost-effective to build, easy to maintain, and resilient to last for decades. A source of pride for my industry is that asphalt pavement is the most recycled product in America. Old pavements can continuously be reused in new pavements. Additionally, the asphalt pavement requires 20% less energy to produce and construct than other pavement materials, meaning fewer greenhouse gas emissions. In most parts of the country, asphalt pavement is produced with locally sourced materials. Yet certain parts of the country need to import raw materials like asphalt binder and aggregate because those materials are not available locally. There are a couple underlying reasons for this. Nationwide, the U.S. lacks the refining capacity to fulfill the asphalt binder demand. And there are certain areas of the country lacking quality aggregate reserves. Without access to these necessary raw materials, road construction would be delayed or altogether cost prohibitive. That is why in certain regions of the country, mixed producers import a small amount of raw materials. And it's why Buy America carries such an importance to our industry. IIJA provided much needed transportation funding for our communities. Wisconsin was able to invest in over 1,300 state and local highway projects, leading to job creation and economic growth. In addition to IIJA's historic highway funding levels, which Napa supported, the package contains significant policy changes like Build America, Buy America. For more than 40 years, Buy America required a domestic manufacturing process for certain products used on federal aid highway projects. The road building industry, the road building industry operated without these sourcing requirements because the components and asphalt pavements are not considered manufactured products based on a waiver granted in 1983 by the Federal Highway Administration. During IIJ negotiations, some wanted to extend Buy America provisions to include various construction materials, which would have made our work more difficult and more costly. Fortunately, we worked with Senator Baldwin and our coalition partners to continue the 1983 exemption status for certain materials like asphalt binder and aggregates, protecting the construction material supply chain. We appreciate the work of many on this committee who reaffirmed the legislative, legislative exemption in IIGA. Thank you to your support as well as collaboration between NAPA and its peer construction material associations. The Office of Management and Budget issued extensive clarification reaffirming congressional intent to ensure federal, state, and local agencies do not place a new domestic sourcing requirement on materials like aggregate and asphalt binder. The backbone of America's economy is its vast roadway system. Our roads connect people and goods, and asphalt is key to facilitating that connectivity. Thank you for your continued support of transportation funding and for having me here today. I have included additional insights in my submitted written testimony. I welcome your questions. Thank you, Mr. Enders. Ms. Salron, you're recognized for five minutes. Chairman Crawford, Ranking Member Norton, and members of the subcommittee, thank you for the opportunity to testify today on behalf of the United Steelworkers, the largest industrial union in the United States. Our members truly supply America, manufacturing the inputs for our nation's infrastructure, from the pigment in yellow road paint to the steel that, use, that, are, that is used in bridges. That is why in August of 2021, we led a multi-state tour visiting USW represented factories to spotlight workers ready and eager to deliver new and improved infrastructure. We heard over and over again that historic investments in our nation's infrastructure should include strong Buy America policies that support American manufacturing workers not corporations that outsource production to countries with weak or non-existent labor and environmental standards. Congress ultimately came together to pass the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act. Included in this bill was a bipartisan Build America, Buy America Act, which builds on the successful impact but limited and inconsistent application of pre-existing Buy America laws. BABA expands Buy America coverage to infrastructure programs across all departments and agencies, Previously, Buy America was limited to only a handful of programs, mostly within DOT. BABA also broadens Buy America to cover manufactured products and, and common construction materials, 
categories that were either waived or not covered by existing laws. To showcase the profound impacts that infrastructure investments coupled with Buy America have on American workers, let me tell you about my union siblings, members of local USW 7-838, making fire hydrants at Mueller in Decatur, Illinois. After the passage of the IIJA, and thanks to Buy America coverage for fire hydrants from a pre-existing law, orders at their plant soared, and the company approached us about mid-contract raises, which is unprecedented. But the benefits don't stop there. The increased orders triggered upstream employment opportunities, including at a copper mine in Utah, a brass manufacturing plant in Ohio, and a brass and bronze foundry in Illinois, all of which are USW-represented facilities. And that's just one example for one product of the ripple effects that these investments with Buy America can have on our workers and their surrounding communities. However, we understand that the implementation is not an easy task. Reversing decades of neglect in our nation's manufacturing base will not happen overnight. But we cannot and must not return to failed policies that have annually sent billions of tax dollars offshore. My written testimony details past significant outsourcing events, including loopholes that enabled the use of Chinese steel for the San Francisco to Oakland Bay Bridge, and a blanket waiver for broadband spending that helped give rise to Huawei and ZTE. BABA means giving our companies and our workers the first shot at supplying the products and materials that go into our critical infrastructure. We commend the Biden administration and DOT for making strides in implementing new Buy America policies. DOT does deserve credit for proactively applying Buy America to electric vehicle chargers and for working to reverse the 40-year-old waiver of manufactured products. Additionally, OMB's final guidance is now complete, which allows DOT to accelerate implementation for the benefit of all stakeholders. But there is more work to do. Billions of dollars are still being spent on infrastructure projects that source for foreign inputs, and here's why. First, DOT delayed BABA's implementation beyond the May 2022 statutory deadline, and major elements of the law are still not in effect. Second, DOT has issued general waivers that limit Buy America application. Instead, DOT should use product specific waivers that are time limited and transparent so that manufacturers can gain insights on supply chain gaps, thus informing capital investments. Program awardees can proceed on necessary infrastructure projects without delays and policymakers can understand where, where we are dependent on China um, or other foreign sources. Finally, DOT must avoid creating new loopholes. This means adhering to BABA's saving provision so that it results in more Buy America, not less. USW stands ready to work with Congress and all stakeholders who are committed to the shared goal of American-made infrastructure. But we soundly reject political gamesmanship that toys with Buy America policies and so too will voters who across the political spectrum overwhelmingly support Buy America laws. On behalf of USW members making the products that are the backbone of American infrastructure, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Sauron. Um, I ask unanimous consent to enter into the record statements from American Traffic Safety Services Association, the Associated Builders and Contractors, the American Road and Transportation Builders Association, and a submission from the Portland Cement Association and the National Ready Mix Concrete Association. Without objection, so ordered. Thank you all for your testimony. We will now turn to questions from the panel. I recognize myself. For questions, I'll start with Mr. Needham. Arkansas's first congressional district is proud to be a hub for steel manufacturing. As you well know, Mississippi County is home of many major steel facilities, including three new core facilities. We appreciate your company's commitment to the families and local community there in our little corner of the country. Could you elaborate on how Buy America requirements embedded in federal policy have allowed domestic manufacturing and indus industrial production to flourish? I didn't catch the last part. Could you ask that once again? Yeah, could, could you elaborate on how Buy America requirements embedded in federal policy have allowed domestic manufacturing and industrial production to, to flourish? Yes. Uh, in two ways. One thing, Buy America, what it does do is gives companies like Nucor um, the uh, uh, confidence to invest in the future, um, knowing that U.S. tax dollars, taxpayers' dollars are going to support and, um, and also, uh, you know, support in buying American-made products. Um, as I mentioned in my, my opening statements, you know, that's allowed Nucor since 2020 to invest $12 billion in our capabilities and expanding our capacity to meet customer demands. 
The other thing I would say about Buy America is it absolutely creates and maintains high paying and excellent jobs um, here in the United States. And I'll give a couple examples. One thing that um, you know, I'll highlight about Nucor is uh, one of the things that, that is excellent about our company is our culture. And our culture is absolutely created by our 32,000 teammates around the um, North America, predominantly here in the United States. And those 32,000 teammates um, create the results that we have in our company. And one way that we share in that is we all share in the, um, the fruits of, of uh, our capabilities and our results. Um, one thing I would like to highlight is, is you know, our teammates participate in a profit sharing program. And that profit sharing program, I'm glad to say last year, Nucor paid out nearly $1 billion to all of our teammates because of what they created. And so Buy America programs help support jobs, create the volume that we need to provide great paying jobs in our local communities. In uh, many cases, this focus on retaining American tax dollar investments in American companies and, and workers actually lowers the bottom line of project costs. And I'm wondering if you could speak to that as well. What are some of the long-term benefits you're realizing? Uh, so long-term benefits also, um, you know, I've spoke to the volume that it creates and in, so we make the investments and those investments we're confident because we have programs like this that will support purchase of American made products in the future. You know, the other thing that our team does is our team makes more money based on um, each ton, safe ton and quality ton that they put out the door. So programs like these support our teammates directly in providing that, um, that volume and that, uh, those great jobs that we need. It also provides the, the infrastructure that we need to support here in the United States, and that's um, absolutely critical part of what we're seeing today through um, the IIJA, the IRA, and the CHIPS Act. Excellent. Thank you, sir. Um, Mr. Braceres, I've, I've spent years pushing and passing legislation that would prevent United States infrastructure dollars from making their way to companies based in China and with links to the Chinese Communist Party. Do state DOTs benefit when federal infrastructure funds are provided to companies in China or would the citizens of Utah and throughout the rest of the country stand to gain more when the U.S. government ensures taxpayer dollars are delivered, delivered to companies in Utah and elsewhere in American businesses? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Ab absolutely. The state of Utah, the citizens of Utah, and the citizens of this country will benefit if we can grow the manufacturing base. I think this is one of the areas where we all agree on the goal, and uh, that goal is to spend American money on American stuff to benefit Americans. And so, um, Mr. Chairman, I may not have heard the last part of your question appropriately, so if I could. Just talking about the value that uh, this, that the investment in American companies delivers to communities. Yeah, absolutely. You know, it's when, when we can help grow American businesses and American companies in the state of Utah, those companies, those people are part of our community. They are invested in our community and all those intrinsic values that make a, a community a great place to live. And when they understand that they're part of that community, they're not only a business, they're a community member, a community partner, and they are invested in the state of Utah for the long term. And so it's absolutely to the benefit, you know, economically, but also from those things that are so intrinsic and the things that we value most in our lives, those, they become friends and they help support our communities. And so I think fundamentally, this is absolutely the right thing to do over the long run is to try to get to a place where we can grow and nurture those businesses in, in the United States, in Utah. Our goal is to, my goal is to deliver projects as effectively as possible and to get the benefits from those projects. And I like to think that the free market system, if I can provide a level playing field, um, I can get that competition to get the best value for, for the taxpayers. And I believe in that. Thank you, sir. Appreciate it. Ranking Member Norton. Well, thank the chair. <clears throat> This, is, this question is for Ms. Uh, Selrin and Mr. Needham. Uh, the Federal Highway Administration has 
longstanding Buy America requirements that apply to iron and steel. These protections are critical as steel is the most widely used metal in the construction industry. So uh, Ms. Salrin and Mr. Needham, can each of you discuss the importance of Buy America in preserving good paying jobs and a robust U.S. manufacturing base? Yeah, thank you for the question. Um, I think with, with robust implementation of Buy America policies, not only can we preserve existing jobs, but we can create more jobs. Buy America essentially gives U.S. producers and workers a first shot at supplying the goods that go into our critical infrastructure. And so um, I think that, you know, we can rebuild our middle class and ensure job security for millions of workers if we ensure robust implementation of Buy America. Yes, I would agree that, you know, when we think of uh, our manufacturing positions, uh, they're high paying jobs, they're excellent um, jobs, and it, it's wonderful to be a part of um, the resurgence of American manufacturing here in the United States. And so Buy America certainly supports that, those efforts. Uh, it brings uh, critical projects that we need for our country, um, and ones where we can certainly provide those at uh, uh, a great service here in the United States with American-made products, and our teammates uh, are absolutely right in the forefront of that. They benefit from that from a standpoint of wage. Um, as I mentioned, you know, our, our teammates, a significant portion of their pay is based on volume and good volume that they put out the door, so these projects certainly support that. And um, they also participate, um, you know, in how we share in the the uh, results of our company. So Buy America certainly supports those. This, this is another question for Ms. Sauron and, and uh, Mr. Needham. There are additional uh, benefits to manufacturing critical construction materials in the United States. Projects, <clears throat> products made in America support jobs that provide access to health care. Thanks to our environmental laws, U.S. manufacturing tends to release fewer carbon emissions in the production pro process when compared with other countries. So Ms. Sauron and Mr. Needham, can you discuss some of the other advantages, including worker benefits and environmental protection that come with supporting manufacturing in America? Yeah, of course. Um, I'll do the worker benefits first. So by supporting American manufacturing and enforcing Buy America policies, you give us demand for U.S. producers to increase production capacity. And when we go to the bargaining table, that gives us more opportunity to advocate for health care benefits, for retirement benefits, instead of fighting for job security. And so it gives us more leeway when we go to the bargaining table to advocate for, for those extra benefits for our members instead of focusing on, on, on job security. Um, and in terms of the environmental protections, um, Strong Buy America policies act um, to prevent shifts in offshore um, in shifts in productions to countries that have lower environmental standards and are high, more polluting um, than, than the United States. And so um, we, we're just exporting our, um, our pollution at that point. Thank you. And, and I would add that from a climate standpoint, one of the things that's probably not well known to, to many though is um, for over 50 years now, Nucor has led the way and um, how we produce steel. And there's a couple ways to produce steel, but we produce it by the circular method. And when I say that, we recycle um, scrap into new steel products. And so our method of making steel versus what I would um, you know, uh, compare it to the blast furnace um, method of extracting iron ore from the earth, which is predominantly what's used around the rest of the world. Um, our method is 66% lower in greenhouse gas emissions. And so by, um, by America provisions here, it certainly promotes American steel products. And I'll tell you, based on um, you know, the American steel industry today is one of the cleanest in the world, and that's a, a fantastic thing that we have as a strength here, right here in the United States. 
My time has expired. A gentlewoman yields, uh, Mr. Webster. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Edmondson, I, I know you're aware of uh, the IIJA's new requirements for an expanded number of items that are would be uh, part of the Buy America. And I, I just wondered if you have any insight into how these, uh, these uh, added items might impact a person putting together a bid uh, in that they, uh, they've got to now find, it could be in a sense a trinket, uh, which sometimes was, was overlooked before but can't be now. Have you, have you any experience in that? Yes, uh, thank you. Um, yeah, we, uh, when we put together a bid, we go out and uh, we've got to pull together pricing on all the components that go into a job. And in anticipation of the Build America, Buy America requirements, we've started asking our manufacturers to provide a certification that, would, that says they can meet that requirement. And more and more times uh, than not, we're, we're seeing um, our manufacturers come back and say they may take exception. And for us as contractors, that, that's a problem because when we have uh, a risk like that, that's what it equates to us. We have to uh, make a decision and it's either proceed with the bid or, or, uh, or deal with it with, the, with our price structure. And uncertainty in our world is not a good thing. So the more and more that we can make this process be, be a, a certainty for us, the better off we're going to be. Um, we agree that we're in the business of building America. So we want this to go in, into, into, in place, but it will take some time on certain products. And like you said, there are minor products that you don't necessarily think about when you're putting, the, putting together a bid on, a, on an interstate project, for instance, that may cause us real problems on the, other, on the other end when we can't procure that product and meet the requirement. Have you found any, uh, any suppliers that just can't do it or having tr difficulty in doing it? We, we do have suppliers that just can't meet the requirement. And we, we tend to see it on... Uh, a lot of times it's with manufactured products where it may be a signal cabinet or uh, a generator, things that, that pull together multiple components to make that product. That gets extremely difficult for these manufacturers at times. And quite frankly, um, the, the market is so good for a lot of these, uh, for a lot of these uh, manufacturers, they're, they're going to go to where they're comfortable too. So they may not pursue... A, a certain type of job. If if you're a generator manufacturer, they may go into a market that's not requiring that. So we're that's causing us some problems. But again, it's going to take some time. But it's it's going to end up being a good a good end result. So is the um, is there a risk involved that you would uh, sort of? a fudge factor of some kind that you might have the wrong product or an uncertified project or something like the product or something like that? Uh, typically the way it works is everything gets pushed down to the contractor. So any requirement, we're, we're ultimately going to be responsible to meet all the requirements that, that whether it's whatever's being imposed. So that's our risk and it's um, something we have to deal with on a daily basis. Uh, also, is, uh, um, is there sort of a added um, cost of, uh, of complying in that there's extra administrative stuff that needs to be done? Is that, have you found that to be true? That is uh, a real possibility. We, our company, we don't have a dedicated person to, that's a procurement individual that meet the guarantees we're going to meet these requirements it it is something our project teams have to do on a regular basis probably one of my biggest concerns is we we know how to uh, to deal with a lot of that 
that process, where you end up with trouble, uh, that, or what I think is you're gonna, you're gonna negatively impact small businesses, disadvantaged businesses in some of these requirements because ultimately we take a price from a subcontractor, we're, we're asking them to guarantee that product meets all requirements. So it's putting a burden on them that they may or may not be able to, to deal with. The time's run out. I uh, thank you for your answers. Yield back. Gentleman yields, Mr. Garcia. Thank you, uh, Chairman and uh, Ranking Member and all the witnesses for your uh, expertise today. Uh, buying uh, America requirements are essential for supporting good paying union jobs that manufacture and produce materials right here in the US. IJA funded infrastructure projects are beginning to break ground and we should be using products made by US companies with US workers that benefit our economy. The American Transportation Research Institute recently announced that the second and third most congested bottlenecks in the country are in or near my district. One of these is a segment on Interstate 290 this highway was constructed in the 1950s, is heavily traveled, and is severely deteriorated. It's in need of reconstruction, and there are plans to add a high occupancy toll lane to improve congestion. A concurrent CTA project is also being considered in the same corridor to rehabilitate the Blue Line Forest Park Branch Rail Station and terminal infrastructure. Uh, Mr. Braceras. Uh, this project is estimated to bring in 22,000 construction-related jobs, will improve safety and mobility, and decrease pollution from idling vehicles. Uh, how can we encourage the state DOTs to abide by Buy America requirements? And what additional resources do the agencies that you represent need to improve compliance and prevent delays? Thank you, Congressman. First of all, all state DOTs support and adhere to the Build America, Buy America provisions, and they're committed to them. I think that's really an important component we need to all understand. It, the, the percentage of items that we, we talk about sometimes is very small in terms of the total project piece, in terms of costs and elements. And so I think it's better understanding of the supply chains to do some market research, to understand the elements that are the, the uh, more difficult ones to find compliance with. As Mr. Edmondson said, you know, when, he's, when a contractor is getting quotes on a job, it's a pretty tight time frame for them to make this, this commitment, and they have to price the risk on that. And so I think as, as a nation, we, if we could better understand the market, and where the stuff is, where are the things that are a challenge to us to have compliance with Build America by America? And then what are the barriers with build, having that on, uh, on short, having that process on short? I think that would help us lend to us getting there in a much smoother way because we wanna be there, we can get there. I know we're gonna get there as a country. It's just how we get there. And I don't want us to stumble over that small, you know, the small items that are more difficult, there is processes we can think about on how as a country we can figure out what are those things we should focus on and then how can we help those elements, companies, the private sector say, you know what, I think there's a business here for me to do this in America and support those jobs. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, Ms. Salrin, uh, Buy America requirements are beneficial for many reasons, including the fact that they support domestic manufacturing jobs with responsible practices. Many countries that we outsource production to have weaker labor and environmental standards. The EPA has determined that they will not apply Buy America to the Clean School Bus Program. Given that Congress has clear, clearly identified that administering Buy America is in the public interest. How do departments and agencies determine that it is in the public interest to waive its application? Thank you for that question. I will note that um, USW last year organized Bluebird manufacturing um, workers in Georgia, and so we have a really high stake 
um, in, in ensuring that EPA does apply um, domestic procurement standards for clean school buses. But I think to answer your question in terms of public interest, USW opposes, strongly opposes public interest waivers and general applicability waivers um, because they do not send market signals and they um, allow for a large variety of foreign products to come in. Um, and we s highly suggest, and, and in my testimony I lay out, that we should focus on product-specific waivers. Um, that will allow manufacturers to see gaps in the supply chain, invest in that, and then as well as allow um, departments of transportation to go ahead with projects without any delay, and then also give members of Congress um, an idea of where we lack in, in domestic capacity. Um, hope, thank you. Thank you much, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. The gentleman's yields, uh, Mr. Bost. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Needham, um, my office has heard from many industry stakeholders that uh, ex ex they're expressing concerns about how the Build America, Buy America Act has been implemented. And I'm, I've been told that the guidance is unclear and takes a long time for the administration to publish rules. Mr. Chair, I request unanimous consent to enter a, into the record a letter from nine industry groups to the, uh, to the administration raising serious concerns about how the law is being implemented. Without objection, so ordered. Okay, now that we've got that in there, Mr. Needham, can you please speak to how the delays affect not, uh, Nucor's ability to meet demand? Also, do you, uh, have you been able to talk with the administration about how to speed up the implementation? The implementation specifically of Buy America? Because mm -hmm. you know, what I would say is the delays that we're seeing is in the, um, the uh, actual breaking ground of projects, um, you know, from an IIJA standpoint and, and, and certainly some of the IRA. Some of that uh, is certainly, I think, one on the panel mentioned uh, labor constraints and actually executing and building the projects. And then the other, I would say, is um, you know, uh, just the, the process, the regulatory process of getting things through. From a Buy America standpoint, um, from our perspective on the steel side, this has been implemented for over 40 years um, through the DOT and the Federal Highway Administration and the FTA, and that has been very effective. So we have not seen delays because of that process. It's very well established. Um, you know, from a standpoint of um, certifying projects, you know, as, as we produce steel, a uh, critical part of our process that we've been doing from day one is certifying what's the components of the steel. And so we issue um, certified mill test reports, and that will, um, you know, show the origins of the steel. And so that has worked very well and continues to work well. So I wouldn't say that we've seen um, delays from that standpoint okay. on Buy America. No. So my second question, you know, as many of you know, I've been a strong supporter of Buy America, and especially, Buy America, especially with our steel industry. I've worked closely with many of my colleagues, including the chair, uh, that our domestic manufacturing base is strong. Now, over the past few decades, the American steel industry has been fighting foreign trade cheats. During the Trump administration this, and supported by, the, by this administration, the Department of Commerce took steps to fight back against illegal dumping of steel and trade tariffs with, with trade tariffs. Now, this action uh, to help boost the industry, however, it seems to be at odds with the decision of uh, drastically increasing the de and deminimizing the threshold for Buy America requirements. Now, I understand that there should be a reasonable level for exempting a product for Buy, uh, but, but changing it from 2,500 2, to a million is a pretty drastic increase. Do you feel that, that's, that these two policies align together, or how does the dollar amount from 2,500 to a million open the door for the same foreign actors to play the same games they did that the, that the department's been trying to stop? Uh, thank you for that question. No, we don't think that that's a, a reasonable raise. And the reason for that is, you know, the, U, the American steel industry today is operating about 76% um, uh, capacity utilization. So there's, there's millions of tons available for us to provide to these types of projects. 
And so raising the de minimis is, is doing exactly what you said, is it's allowing foreign steel to come in when we can supply that. The other thing it does, and I mentioned previously, is that you know, the steel made here in the United States is 66% less in greenhouse gases. So it's worse for, for our climate by bringing in foreign steel. And today in, in America, over 70%, about 70% of our steel is made through the circular steel method with, uh, with Nucor and our competitors leaving the way. Well, thank you for answering that question. I just want to make sure we got that on the record. It is my hope that every administration in the future understands how important it is to make sure that we are using American-made steel and, and, and other products. Uh, we know how it affects our communities. Uh, how important it is to keep people working, but not only that, to know that the quality of the, the product that we're putting in meets that standard that, that we, we expect. With that, Mr. Ch Chairman, I yield back. Gentleman yields, Mr. Menendez. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Ms. Alvarez, uh, I appreciate the United Steelworkers being one of the strongest proponents of Buy America policies. As you know, the Biden administration has issued new, stronger Buy America standards for electric vehicle chargers. Unfortunately, some in Congress attempted to repeal those standards earlier this year, so it's important to set the record straight, especially given the importance of electrification projects across the country. A few local examples from my district include New Jersey Transit's efforts to convert their bus fleet to electric vehicles and their work on converting diesel ferries to electric. I'm excited to share that earlier this year, they received a federal grant of $7 million to carry out this important work. Ms. Sauron, can you speak to the importance of strong Buy America standards and their impact on the electrification of the broader transportation industry, such as electric buses and electric ferry programs? Yes, thank you for the question. Um, to discuss the EV, manu the EV charger uh, waiver that, that DOT had, had implemented, um, basically this waiver deviates from a 1983 manufactured product waiver. Um, DOT acted proactively to ensure that EV chargers and the manufacturers um, started domestic capacity because we had, three years ago, we had, we had zero um, manufacturers um, manufacturing EV chargers. And so with, with the waiver or implementing policy, um, this allows for manufacturers to invest, build up domestic capacity in order to meet the 55% domestic content threshold. Um, and I, we believe that DOT has taken the right steps um, and continues to do so and solely supportive of their efforts to increase domestic production of, of EV charging um, stations. That's great, thank yeah. you for that. Mr. Enders, thank you for your testimony this morning highlighting the importance of Build America, Buy America exemptions for the asphalt paving industry. New Jersey's eighth district is one of the busiest transportation hubs in the country. Thanks to the IIJA in fiscal years 22 and 23, New Jersey was awarded $110 million in grants for road and bridge improvements, and the state was reimbursed $166 million for their work. These projects are critical to improving New Jersey infrastructure, and asphalt payment is a critical material in completing these projects. Mr. Enders, can you share how road and bridge projects in New Jersey are impacted by construction material exemptions? Yes, thank you for the question. Um, you know, in, in different areas of the country, the availability to get asphalt binder or the availability to get quality aggregates differs. You know, in, in Wisconsin, we have quality aggregates and, and we can get them right there in Wisconsin and it's pretty rural. So the ability to open a quarry and get rock is, is a lot different, I'm sure, than it is in New Jersey, New York and, and areas like that where where there isn't the room and, and the challenges. So it having the ability to bring in materials to that area from, let's say, Canada and other areas like that, um, supplement the products that exist. And I, I think also what it does is it, it gives contractors flexibility. Um, it, it gives them resources that's gonna allow them to um, bid on more projects, complete more work. Yeah, you mentioned some of the dynamics specific to areas like New Jersey and the Northeast. How critical is recycled asphalt pavement usage within the New Jersey roadway market? So recycled asphalt is making up right now over 20% uh, of new asphalt mix that goes out onto the roadway. When you're in urban areas that you're describing, the amount of, of reclaimed asphalt is, there's plenty. 
and the ability to continue to use more reclaimed asphalt, which ultimately gives you aggregates and asphalt binder, continues to help you be less re reliant on the materials you're getting from other places. Yeah, and there's other, other benefits as well. You also mentioned in your testimony that recycled asphalt pavement is a big part of the asphalt industry's focus on sustainability. Can you share more about that effort and the importance of exempting asphalt binder? You know, part of exempting asphalt binder, again, it is, it's not that we don't produce it in the United States, right? Over 80%, I believe, is produced in, in the United States. We're using it to supplement what we have going on. The recyclability, as, as we continue to be able to do more of that, you know, it helps us go closer to, you know, net zero emissions by 2050. Um, and it continues to be an avenue to reuse our materials that we, we have down. I mean, that, that's one of the benefits of asphalt is that it continues to be reused and reused most of the time back in the asphalt mix itself. Right, thank you all so much, and I yield back. Gentlemen, yields, Mr. LaMalfa. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Needham, I would, I'm kind of a side thought on this. China was known for a long time as taking so much of our scrap metals and such. What, uh, do you have an idea what that, what that percentage is these days? Are they using less of our scrap? Are we keeping more of it, like you're talking about in that circular conversation you're saying? I don't have the specific uh, content or amount that they're taking, but what I would tell you is, you know, China produces steel predominantly through the extractive method, so they would use less scrap in their process, although they are, uh, they have expanded in their- That's what you're alluding to, but it seemed for at least a long time that they were taking of, of the bulk of American scrap and uh, reconfiguring it over there. Yeah, the bulk of American scrap is is recycled here in America. So yeah, today good. about 20% at most, for, you know, 15 to 20% would be going export, but, but most of it is staying here in the U.S. Okay, good, that's a, that's a big plus for all the logistics. I know you keep talking about greenhouse gas, but I have to remind everybody CO2 is only 0.04% of our atmosphere and all this net zero talk is is folly, especially when you're considered that America <clears throat> is one of the countries already flattening the CO2 curve and China and others keep upping theirs. And so we'll do, do good by doing that, but uh, we're gonna throttle ourselves. We keep pur pursuing these uh, crazy CO2 goals and net zero stuff. So. Maybe we could back off on that a little bit, but um, I wanted to ask also, uh, Mr. Baceres, Mr. Edmondson, as, as we keep going hell-bent towards this electric vehicle and these charging stations and they're doing waivers in order to get the material from somewhere else, get these projects from somewhere else, do you think perhaps we could prioritize other infrastructure, other projects while we wait to scale up this domestic manufacturing for chargers that could be made here and the other components. So, so we're not sending so much dollars to foreign competitors. Yes, um, thank you for the question. In Utah, we take an approach of all of the above. We can't just put all of our eggs in one basket. And so air quality is one of the concerns that we deal with in Utah. We live in a basin. And when we get the, summer, the uh, winter inversions, we get the air gets trapped in there when the air is not moving. And so air quality is a very high concern for our citizens. So going towards electric vehicles, hybrid vehicles, um, hydrogen is something that we're looking at. We still believe that coal is gonna play a good part of our portfolio and oil and gas is a big part of the extractive industry in Utah as well. So we believe an all and above approach and that how you get there is really important. I mean, we all agree on the goal where we wanna be, but we need to figure out the right transition methods so that the markets can see where we're going, the markets can adjust to where we're going as they can minimize risks to make investments in the long well, run. Sir, that's not really an answer. What I'm looking for is can we prioritize other things instead of having to buy foreign products because we have to hurry on this electric charger bit? So, I'm probably not understanding your question very well. Um, we believe electrification will be part of the future in Utah. Um, we would have liked to have seen the guidance come out a little quicker out of the administration to help us implement this, and we do need some flexibility, but we're not Thank thinking Thank you. Mr. Edmondson, would you take a crack at that? Okay. 
Um, I would answer the question um, this way. I think the manufacturing capacity in the country will move to the available markets. So if whatever those are, I mean, it, it will be the EV market, it will be the component of uh, the, the product example I gave. I think the, the capacity in this country to move into those markets and fill the needs that we're gonna have will, will, will definitely take place. If, is there gonna be a priority given to EV over uh, a generator manufacturer being able to meet that? I well, in that we're doing waivers in order to make EV charging systems and they have to come from somewhere else whereas maybe we could be working on other things instead of hurrying EV chargers and having um, American jobs and American manufacturing. That's what I'm getting at. I, I believe um, we, that's part of our argument. With, with, we want a clear process that is, dealt, is not politicized and really? it allows the manufacturers to, to move into the markets that, that where, where we need to move. And that's part of our concern the way it is programmed right now, OMB is basically going to dictate a lot of these answers, and that's why we're a proponent. That's the thing. That's but, not a market. That's being forced into a market that we're seeing that uh, consumers are not chasing with electric cars. As you see Ford pulling back, others pulling back. And then a, a recent story I just saw on hydrogen, which, hey, it'd be great, but it seems like there's people a lot less confident in hydrogen's future, so better yield back, Ms. Shannon. Thank you. <laughs> Gentleman yields, Mr. Johnson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank the witnesses for your testimony today. Um, for years, we've listened to Donald Trump, better known as individual number one, brag about made in America as his White House defended his own companies producing products overseas in countries such as China, Bangladesh, and Indonesia. Donald Trump's rhetoric about made in America was like his infrastructure week and his replacement for the Affordable Care Act and his desire to build the wall. It was all words and no intention to get it done. On the other hand, President Biden came in with a serious plan and competently took swift action and passed the Bipartisan Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act within his first year in office. The result is the U.S. economy, uh, which is experiencing some of the strongest economic growth in the world, rather than trickle-down economics. Uh, it's expanding the economy from the bottom up and the middle out. President Biden's policies of upgrading infrastructure and promoting domestic procurement through robust Build America, Buy America provisions is an important component of that economic growth. And the mandates to use American-made materials to boost domestic manufacturing, fortify supply chains, and foster the creation of high-quality union jobs is making a tremendous difference in the lives of the American people. Uh, Ms. Salrin, last month I had the honor of welcoming EPA Administrator Michael Reagan to my district to celebrate the announcement that DeKalb County Schools, the DeKalb County School District, has been awarded $20 million to purchase all electric buses under the Environmental Protection Agency grant program. And with major interstates running through my district, exposing residents to particulate matter and nitrogen dioxide, which are especially harmful to our children, I fully support the transition to electric vehicles and school buses. Buy America plays a crucial role in creating U.S. jobs and strengthening our economy, particularly as the economy, as the global economy transitions away from the internal combustion engine to cleaner renewable energy sources that ameliorate the effects of climate change. It's also, uh, so can you speak to the importance of uh, the Buy America on the global um, transition towards electric powered vehicles and on how Buy America contributes to U.S. economic growth? 
Of course. So USW is the largest union in the auto supply chain. Um, we manufacture a variety of auto parts specific to internal combustion engines, um, as well as numerous um, parts that go into EVs. And we also represent a majority of the oil workers. Um, but, but Buy America, proper implementation of Buy America will allow us to transition and have a larger stake in the electric vehicle market. Um, like I mentioned before, three years ago, we didn't have any EV charger manufacturers. Um, and that is a problem because a transition is happening and we need to make sure that we're ready for it and workers are trained and jobs are there for workers to transition to. And so um, Buy America policies offer that, um, that kind of flexibility in ensuring that we can have the good paying jobs still um, during the transition to cleaner um, and a diverse electric vehicle fleet, yeah. Thank you. The United Steelworkers Union is one of the strongest proponents of Buy America policies. And the Biden administration has issued robust Buy America standards for electric vehicle chargers. Unfortunately, however, some in Congress tried to repeal those standards earlier this, this year, but fortunately they did not prevail. Can you speak to why uh, President Biden's Buy, Buy America strict standards for EV chargers are, uh, are, is so important? Yes, so Biden's policy deviated from a 1983 manufactured products waiver, which basically would have made EV chargers not covered by Buy America at all. And what his policy did was phased in implementation, and it requires final assembly to be done in, in the United States while manufacturers um, invest in, in critical capacity. Um, and then, you know, in July, we will be, um, the requirements will be exactly what BABA had, 55% domestic content for EV chargers. And so what the Biden policy did is it encouraged domestic investment um, to meet those requirements. Thank you, and I yield back. Gentleman yields, Mr. Stauber. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Needham, I, I want to uh, real quickly ask you, you said uh, Nucor does a 66% cleaner than the original blast furnaces. Does that take into account the original make of the steel you're recycling? Yeah, just yes or no, because I gotta move on. The can you repeat that, please? So 66% cleaner, you said, Nucor, right? Yes. Than, than the blast furnaces. Does that percentage take into account the original make of the steel? The, the recycled content, the scrap, uh, is, is, the makeup of that is not. It's not, it. okay, so it doesn't include. Obviously from the iron range, I'm gonna protect uh, the uh, taconite. Uh, Ms. Solarina, thank you for, for being here today. Uh, I appreciate you being here. Uh, recently, the EPA has finalized the nation's first ever limits on emissions of mercury at taconite plants. Are you aware of the rule? I am aware of it, but I have, I have not been, um, I, I do not handle that issue for, for the steel workers. You don't handle the issue for the steel workers? Yeah, that's a, that's a different staffer, but this, I can. Do you realize that six of the seven taconite plants in this country are USW workers in the district I represent? Uh, are you concerned that this impact is gonna, is gonna put our steel workers out of, out of work and foreign source to steel? Are you concerned about that? The USW is concerned and we've been having discussions with EPA. Did, did the USW in the rulemaking put any comments forward? Um, we did and we're happy to provide those comments to you, yep. Uh, okay, I don't think you did. I can't find any USW opposition to this rule. So we'll, I'll look forward to, if yep. I'm wrong, I look forward to you correcting me, okay? Yep. Because I have no knowledge of USW pushing back against this rule. Um, you know, we talk, about, uh, we talk about EV charging stations. So in northeastern Minnesota, we mine a taconite that makes 80, 82% of the steel made in this country. Um, in your testimony, and what you said today, is uh, USW opposes waivers, and you said, uh, we need to build up our domestic capacity. And just moments ago, you said that we need to build up our critical capacity. Let's just talk about EV charging uh, stations. You are aware the Biden administration wants to scrap Buy America for the EV charging stations, correct? You're aware of that? 
That is not correct. That is correct. That is correct. In fact, $7.4 billion you want to waive to allow removing the Buy American. We had, the, we had a hearing on it. Do you support waiving Buy American for the, uh, the steel and the concrete and the critical minerals in the EV charging stations? Are, do you support that? It is a product-specific waiver Wait a minute. that allows us to build up domestic capacity. How can you build up domestic capacity when Biden has shut down our, our, our critical mineral mine? You can't build up domestic capacity. We have, in northeastern Minnesota, man, we have the biggest copper nickel find in the world. 95% of the nickel, 88% of the cobalt, over a third of the copper, other platinum root metals that go into the EV chargers, uh, et cetera, EV vehicles. And he shut it down. So when you say build up domestic capacity, let me kind of rephrase it what you're saying. Currently, the administration that you support is working on memorandums of understanding with the Chinese government in the Congo that owned 15 of the 19 mines that use child slave labor, no environmental standards, and no labor standards. I want our union workers in northeastern Minnesota to mine those critical minerals. Don't you? We do too, yes. And, and so how can we build up critical capacity when, when, when Joe Biden and his administration shuts it down? It, does, you, it doesn't make sense to me uh, in, in your ex explanation on building up critical capacity. It's not happening. You're going outsourcing it. You don't want to outsource that, right? Because that removes union jobs. Am I right? That, that is correct. That is correct. Don't we want to build up domestic supply? And remember... As a candidate, Joe Biden in October of 2020 said to the American people, we are going to mine these critical minerals domestically. That was music to our ears. After he was sworn in, what did he do? What did he do? He changed his mind for mining domestically. That hurts our steel workers. I want you to make sure that our boots on the ground steel workers in northeastern Minnesota are taken care of. The EPA rule on mercury for you not to uh, comment on it, and then and then supporting a waiver. You said you don't support waivers. The, the USW supported the waiver on the Buy American for the EV charging stations, and I think this is simply unacceptable. We need the work. Northeastern Minnesota can mine these critical minerals, ma'am, like better than anybody in the country. And, and we I agree. Yield back. Yep. And I yield back. Gentleman yields, Mr. Manns. Uh, th thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you all for being here today. I represent the big first district of Kansas, uh, primarily rural district uh, in the western two-thirds of Kansas where transportation is very, very important. We have 83,000 miles of roads, more than 4,000 miles of railroad tracks, 67 public airports, and, and we rely heavily on this infrastructure to get our ag products um, out of the fields. Um, off the farms, away from feed yards, and, and into markets. Buy America requirements have expanded domestic manufacturing capabilities and have had positive impacts on both Kansas and the U.S. workforce and economy. However, there's been a significant confusion and uncertainty, as I see it, around the implementation of IIJA and the included Build America, Buy America Act. At a time when our country is facing historic inflation and supply chain disruptions, um, ONB issued implementation guidance without consideration of our country's domestic manufacturing capabilities in the first place. This inconsistency and lack of transparency in waiver requirements has put significant strains on the industry and has led to increased cost delays and the inability to source and procure products, as been mentioned earlier. ONB must produce consistent, transparent, and timely guidance on Build America, Buy America for compliance, and so these projects uh, do not continue to be stalled. A handful of questions. Um, first for you, Mr. Edmondson. Again, thanks for being here. Currently, OMB final guidance provides agencies with discretion concerning the issuance of Build America by America, these waivers we've been talking about. Um, what do you believe we need to do to um, streamline and make the process more efficient? Basically, how, how do we need to, uh, to, to fix these, these waiver issues um, that we keep hearing talked about? The best example I can give you is uh, AGC of America, specifically our, our utility infrastructure division, works closely with the EPA. And they are very knowledgeable on our concerns. They are knowledgeable on the products we're having trouble with. The more we utilize, um, let, let the agencies that deal with the projects 
be more involved. That, that's the easiest solution that I can give you, and it works because, again, our, uh, our relationship just with the EPA is, is uh, invaluable, and, and it's creating a great platform and a great forum for us to discuss the problems, and then they can then take it to, to wherever they've got to take it to deal with the issues that we're seeing, but they, they are very familiar with, with what's going on in the market. And I think that would be the case, whether it's a highway issue or, or we'll pick your example, federal issue, whatever, it's going to be the same, I believe. Um, many comments filed in the docket in response to OMB's Build America by America guidance emphasize the need for consistent implementation of the legislation's requirements. In its final guidance, OMB stated its intention to regularly convene interagency working groups to ensure that the federal agencies implement Build America by America in a consistent, uniform, efficient, and transparent manner. Again, Mr. Edmondson, do you think the state DOTs have been invited to engage in these working groups um, to bring frontline experience and reality? I mean, is this, are these working groups helping? Are the working groups working, so to speak? And are we seeing improvements? Yes. Um, in North Carolina, we have a joint committee with our DOT, our Carolina's AGC, our local chapter. That's been a great resource, and it's, again, it's a great forum for us to voice any concerns that we have in the marketplace, and then it, it also, they have that information, and they can, uh, they're helping to, on the design side, uh, they're helping to mitigate where they can any issues that, that aren't going to be sourced, or, hard, or more, that would be difficult to source here. Okay, uh, and for you, Mr. Uh, Bracero, it's kind of the same question. Um, what, what's your thought on these working groups? Have, have you all been invited to participate? Uh, any feedback on our standpoint, from your standpoint? Yes, thank you, Congressman. Um, yes, I think relationships have been mentioned before, but you know the, the, the folks at the Federal Highway Administration, they're friends of ours, and they listen to us, and they're constantly reaching out and asking what they can do to help. We have folks in our division office that are Utah citizens that are aware of what we're dealing with, and that relationship really helps us get through some of these more difficult conversations. At the end of the day, it's gonna get down to us understand the supply chains and what the market truly is, to understand how we can get to the point where 100% of everything, we don't have to even ask for waivers. Yeah. But it's a deliberate process of doing this, and we have to do it with the input from the stakeholders. Great, thank you. Uh, Mr. Chairman, with that, I yield back. The gentleman yields, Ms. Titus. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. We've heard a lot about the impact on Buy America for the economy and how it creates jobs, it's good for workers. I suspect that the Buy America plan also benefits our environment. Uh, can you talk about how it contributes to a more sustainable uh, construction industry? Maybe Mr. Needham? Yes, what I've, what I've referred to before is that uh, it certainly does um, benefit our environment and one way it does is that the American steel industry from our perspective and, and today over 70% of it produces steel by the circular steel method so recycle scrap. So the way we make steel here in the United States is 66% um, lower greenhouse gases than the uh, blast furnace average around the world. So absolutely it does um, benefit from that standpoint. So that's another benefit from Buy America, just saving absolutely. the planet. Ms. Salron? Yeah, so I would like to, to draw your attention. Um, in my written testimony, I highlighted how Buy America is so good for our shared environmental goals. And um, the National Academy of Science is, did a research that showed a large fraction of Chinese emissions are due to the manufacture of goods for foreign consumption. They cited that Los Angeles experiences at least one extra day a year of smog that exceeds federal ozone limits because of nitric oxides and carbon monoxide emitted by Chinese factories making goods for exports. And so it is really important that we limit our um, procurement to American made so that we're not um, benefiting Chinese polluters for entering our market and um, degrading our own environment. Sounds like it. Anybody else? Comment? I, I would just like to add that um, the exemption allows the asphalt industry to use reclaimed asphalt pavement. Currently, we're, we're recycling over 90 million tons of asphalt in the United States and continue to look at increasing that. That's great. 
Right. I'm glad to, glad to hear that. I think that's worth mentioning and putting on the record, so thank you very much. My second question has to do with waivers. I think you mentioned this in your testimony, that we need fewer broad general waivers of Buy America, but that the time-limited product-specific waivers uh, can be useful tools or useful signals to the market. Would you elaborate on that? Yes, of course. So USW strongly opposes the general applicability public interest waivers that, that cover a variety of products like the 1983 Manufactured Products Waiver. Um, with product-specific waivers, we give manufacturers the ability to, if they're transparent, you give the manufacturers the ability to go in, see the waivers, see the products that the waivers cover and build up domestic capacity. And not only does that allow for us to be able to supply that, those products later when the time limit is up, but it also allows Congress to know kind of where our supply chain gaps are and it allows for transportation workers and state DOTs to continue projects without any delay. Um, if, if they're having trouble sourcing products. So product-specific waivers are really good, um, and, it, and the more that we have them, the more it means Buy America's working, because we're making sure that we're investing in the best capacity by that. So they act as incentives for us to develop those industries that we're now having to get a waiver for to go outside. Correct, Just because the, the decades of deindustrialization um, it doesn't happen overnight, and so they allow us to, to build up that capacity. Anybody else? All right, well, thank you. I yield back. Gentleman yields, Mr. Owens. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Build America, Buy America does not simply represent policy. It represents the fundamental goal to reinvest America taxpayer dollars at home in our own communities, supporting American workers, businesses, and communities. However, in the, even in the best government policies need refinement if it's not working for the cities, states, and communities. Following exorbitant uh, government spending by this administration, Buy America requirements could not be more relevant. Every member of this committee shares the common goals of strengthening infrastructure, revitalizing American manufacturing, and fostering economic growth. Let's continue working together for this reality without the undue burden placed on American innovators and job creators. Um, first of all, I appreciate uh, the education that I'm getting, Ashley, uh, the idea of what waivers mean and how that impacts us and our goal to kind of make sure we're doing it right. Um, Mr. Evanson, you mentioned uh, part of the solution would be APA taking a bigger role. What I want to do is ask each, uh, Ms. Maceris, uh, Ms. Needham, and Ms. Enders, how, what do you see the, the best way of working, keeping our priorities on America first, but yet tweaking our, our waivers so that it can fit in, so we can grow this process where we can actually get to a point where we don't need waivers again. So how, your industry basically, how, how would you do that? Start off, Mr. Mr. Yes, thank, thank you, Congressman. So uh, I think it's important to recognize that, you know, there's a, lot, there's a lot of moving parts to this. And as state DOTs are trying to move projects forward, we've got that goal of getting those projects advertised to get the safety benefits and the mobility benefits out there. And so we really encourage our federal partners to recognize of what we're trying to accomplish, but we're trying to do it within the parameters and the rules that are set by Congress and by those federal agencies. And sometimes it doesn't feel like we have that necessarily, um, they're recognizing what we're trying to accomplish. It feels like there might be more of a, you know, singular focus on what their rule is or what their goal is. And so I think encouraging the continual collaboration so that when we're having a conversation with the different federal agencies, there's a recognition of what the end goal is. What we're trying to make, we're trying to save lives and make lives better, fundamentally. And we can do that, and we can still meet the provisions of Build America, Buy America, if we all agree that we're gonna to work together towards those common goals, recognize some elements are gonna be more difficult to get to. They are a very small percentage of what's actually being invested in transportation. Let's figure out what it takes together to get there. Okay, Mr. Needham. Yes, thank you for the question. What, what I would say from a waiver standpoint, um, it, absolutely necessary, but applied in a, in a narrow project, um, you know, specific basis. And the reason I say for that is a lot of times what's under, not understood well is most of these products can be made right here in the United States, in America, with American-made um, teammates and workers. And so the exceptions are very few. And so having a robust process around the waiver process is very important. And, you know, from our standpoint, 
you know, the guidelines give 15 days to respond to that, and that seems adequate. Sometimes, though, we're seeing that we have seven days or less to reply. And so I think it's important to have that uh, robust process because a lot of these exceptions are made when we can just make the products here, and that's not well known. Okay. Mr. Andrews? Yeah, I think for the asphalt industry, you know, maybe it's slightly different because what we're getting exemptions for in waivers are some of the inputs coming in to America. 100% of, of the asphalt that are in our parking lots and the roads we're driving on is produced and made here in the United States. Um, you know, as we continue to look at alternative ways in areas of the country where maybe they don't have access to quality raw materials, I, I think some of those alternatives can maybe provide ways to get to your goal. Okay, I'm, I'm just gonna say this. We need to continue to advocate for your voices and the point was made earlier, we have small business owners that truly are at risk. And our culture has to, has to give them that room. That's where, our, that's, where, that's where we're based, that's our country, that's our freedom. So whatever you can do to advocate for those small business owners, let us know. We're gonna get a more innovative uh, legislator, that's our goal, to make sure we can hear from you guys and, and do the right thing. So thank you so much and I yield back my time. Gentlemen yields, Mr. Carbajal. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. First, let me say thank you to all the witnesses being here today. Ms. Sauron, my father was once affiliated with the United Steelworkers of America as a copper miner in Arizona. So uh, I have an affinity for your uh, union. Um, Mr. Anders, uh, thank you for the acknowledgement regarding our committee's work on ensuring that OMB understood your industry's unique insights and various comments communicated to the agency. Now with the Buy America ambiguity settled, what is the biggest priority facing your industry as we work on the next highway bill? Thank you, and, and thank you for your help for our Buy America exemptions. Um, really the biggest priority for the asphalt pavement industry is, is sustainable road funding. Um, the funding we have now, as, as I mentioned earlier, created over 1,300 projects in the state of Wisconsin, predominantly where we work. Um, but there are many more on the shelf, and, and sustainable funding is something that can lead us to, to do those projects. Great. As a follow-up question, we are now two and a half years into the bipartisan infrastructure law. It's hard to believe that much time has gone by. As we are entering the final stages of this bipartisan infrastructure law and start turning our attention towards the next highway bill ahead of 2026, does the certainty provided by OMB help clarify how the construction material supply chain may operate, minimize delays, and cost overruns as it relates to your pavement production? Yes, it does. We, we were very nervous as it went through the process to understand where we were going to be able to get resources to build roads. And, you know, when, when we don't know where our materials are going to be coming from and different things. We worry about hiring, investing in equipment, different things like that. So yes, we're happy with where we're at. Thank you. Mr. Braceres, I think we can all agree that it is good policy to increase the domestic manufacturing base in the United States. However, we know we can't flip a switch and create new industries overnight. Can you give me your opinion on the implementation of the bipartisan infrastructure law by America provisions from the perspective of a state de department of transportation, specifically how it is implement, how the implementation process is working in Utah. Do you have any recommendations on how to improve the implementation process? Thank you. Yes, I would say generally the, the implementation of IIJA is working well in Utah and working well for all state DOTs around the country. Um, you should be proud of your state departments of transportation and how they're implementing that. The, Certainty is important in any program, especially when we're in making these types of investments. So we like to know what's expected of us, and so that early um, definition and guidelines are very important, especially with as it pertains to IIJA. We saw a little bit of, a, I'll say, a speed bump in the implementation of the electric charging program because we are waiting for the guidance on that one right now. Um, so we look forward to continuing to work with this committee on the reauthorization. I love my, uh, the comment down here it was, you know, long-term sustainable funding, the formula funding program provides us that stability to be able to make strategic investments into the future. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Chair, I yield back. Thank you. Gentleman yields, Mr. Johnson. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, Mr. Edmondson, well, I'll talk a little bit to you, and uh, thanks for coming up in the conversation we had before today's hearing. Uh, I'm grateful for that. So our country produces 95 million tons of uh, cement every year. We, we use 120 million, and for that reason, I think IIJA really called out, really exempted uh, cement and cementious materials uh, from some of these Buy American requirements. And yet we still had a lot of conversations today about, about the uncertainty. You had mentioned in your testimony that contractors can deal with two different state DOTs who have slightly different interpretations. And so let's dive into that a little bit more. I mean, tell me about the contractors and the confusion they may have when they bring cement onto a work site, trying to understand whether or not that, that has to, whether or not Buy America applies to that. Again, we, we, would, um, we would ask our suppliers to, to be involved in that process to identify the issues they've got, and, and that's probably our biggest resource. We rely on them uh, to provide all that critical information. So if they're seeing those issues, we would then take it to the project owner and, and deal with it that way. So, so what causes the confusion? I mean, you know, as, Mr., as Mr. Carvajal mentioned, I mean, we're two years in, and I know we've, we've gotten some additional clarity, and we're probably a lot further along than we were a year ago, but it still seems that, these con that I keep hearing about these conversations. Yeah, probably the biggest thing is we're just, I think the, this flow of money that's going to have this requirement is just now hitting the market. So I think you've had this long delay, but it's been in design and it's been in, you know, going through the engineering process. So I think of seeing the requirements go into effect. So that's probably been some of the confusion. Was it, and when was it going to be implemented? You know, it kept getting moved and, and then uh, back in um, the fall, it was, it was implemented and, and that's, that's what we're, that's what I think it is. Mr. Braceres, uh, talk to me about Federal Highway. What can they be doing better in this arena? Yeah, I think, you know, we, we can always do some things better. And again, let me say that Federal Highways has been great partners in how we implement this. One of the true advantages Federal Highways has is they have Federal Highway employees in every single state in the country who understand how we operate and they understand the challenges that we have. And so it's to continue to provide that resource and to help I'll say support them in their decision-making roles. They're making decisions. We, we go to them all the time asking them, well, what do you think of this? Can we do this? And if they don't have to look over their shoulder back to Washington too often, if they actually are trusted to make those decisions, um, that would be very helpful. And I think this administration is doing a good job supporting those amazing men and women there. Um, we, as states, we're always, we're, we're kind of quirky in that we'll say like, well, we want flexibility except for when we want consistency. <laughs> and um, we all know we've all been there in that type of situation, but I think Federal Highways is a model in terms of how to implement Build America, Buy America. I'd love to see more consistency. We do a lot of transit work as well. Things are not necessarily consistent between the modal agencies. And so I think consistency from USDOT over all their modal agencies would be helpful not only for the the departments of transportation, but probably also for our contractors as well. I think that's really well said about the, the need for consistency between and among agencies. And you're right, there's this natural push and pull for the federal highway folks in the, age, in the states. Giving them that sort of autonomy it makes a ton of sense. Rhetorically, it's strong. But doesn't it contribute to this patchwork quilt we've heard about today? I don't, I would say that there's not a significant patchwork. Okay. There's going to be, there's consistency in making sure that the law is followed, the rules are followed, but there's an understanding of the uniqueness. Every state has some unique market differences, material sources differences, and those folks at the Federal Highway Administration at the state level, they can recognize those unique differences and help, help us deal with it. I mean, we had a, a cement powder shortage in the state of Utah over the last year and a half. 
We were bringing in cement powder from South Dakota, North Dakota, um, and we work with those state DOTs to say, hey, does this meet the spec? Does that have all the compliance? So there's great collaboration going on across the industry. Well, I'm sure, I'm sure the GCC plan in Rapid City, South Dakota was happy to help, and with that, Mr. Chairman, I would yield back. The gentleman yields, uh, Ms. Shelton. Thank you, Chair Crawford and Ranking Member Norton for holding this really important hearing. Uh, and thank you so much for our witnesses uh, for being here today, sharing your insights into the challenges and opportunities of Buy America. When Secretary Buttigieg uh, testified in front of this committee in September, he noted that the Department of Transportation is looking to implement strategic on-ramps to Buy America to address supply chain concerns and build the necessary domestic infrastructure to meet that 70% threshold. Uh, I have a number of questions. Ms. Salran, my, my first question is for you. I represent over 700 employees of a tier one auto supplier that's working to build the first automated electric vehicle in America. They're committed to utilizing American labor and American materials, but they need 5,000 tons of steel annually. Do you believe temporary waivers to the Buy America requirements are the best way for companies like theirs to fulfill their supply requirements until domestic manufacturing can build up and meet those needs, uh, and, and feel free to offer suggestions uh, to, to tweaks as well. Yes, without knowing what kind of steel um, this company needs, um, the steel industry is, is, has a lot of capacity, and so they're able to support a lot of needs. Um, but without knowing that, I will say project-specific waivers are really important because they allow that dentist capacity to be built up over time um, if we don't have it uh, currently available. Mr. Enders, there are two major highway improvement projects needed in my district in West Michigan. These projects will rely on American asphalt. I'm glad we were able to maintain waivers in the IAJA for materials uh, like aggregate and asphalt binder to ensure economical and sustainable sourcing. Are there concerns about other roadway materials that would benefit from the identified strategic on-ramps or temporary waivers, and, and how might you suggest uh, that, that we address those? You know, looking at the waivers we have, you know, most of the other things we're getting are, are produced here in the United States and in our states. Um, so I, I, I think we just continue with the exemptions that we have for our industry and I think everything falls in line with that. Thank you. Um, my, my last question, the new policy entitled uh, Waiver of Buy America Requirements for Electric Vehicle Chargers, the title of that program sounds like a weakening of the Buy America standards. Ms. Sauron, can you explain why that's not the case? Yes, of course. So it actually strengthens Buy America standards for EV chargers. Um, it's an implementing policy that allows that EV chargers to, manufacturers of EV chargers to build up domestic capacity while um, they're brought online. And the current waiver or implementing policy um, requires that final assembly already be built in the United States. And so that is one good Thing that it, that's in the waiver, but it also uh, requires the iron and steel of, of that charger to be built here too. Um, and then in July, um, it'll take full effect. Um, Buy America coverage will be in full effect for EV chargers. And so this allows um, domestic manufacturers to build up capacity to meet the demand of the EV charging network. And so um, the Biden policy actually strengthens um, Buy America coverage for EV chargers, not weakens it. Thank you. Yep. If we are to hold these companies to unrealistic standards, uh, what 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 is the impact there? I'm sorry. Can you repeat your question? It, 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 holding holding, uh, you're, you're talking about it not weakening uh, the standards, but strengthening, implementing unrealistic standards. Uh, what are what are the impacts uh, there on on the steel industry? Yeah, um, I would I would say. The impacts of unrealistic standards um, open up our supply chains to, or put our manufacturers and our workers at at risk for domestic for foreign um, inputs to come in, and so um, and allows projects not to go through. And so, having these 
specific waivers allows that flexibility, and which is needed, when, especially since um, our nation has had disinvestment in, de in deindustrialization for over decades now, um, and we need to build up those critical supply chains um, because of the, the lack of industrial policy that we've had in the past. Thank you. Very helpful. Thank you all for your time today. Gentlemen yields, Mr. Yakum. Just kidding. <laughs> Ms. Chavez Dreamer. <laughs> You never know who's going to show up right behind you, and you're like, oh, you think you're in line. <laughs> thank you, Chairman. Uh, thank you all for being here uh, today. As a new member of Congress and representing Oregon's 5th District, there's so much to learn in this industry. Uh, Ms. Salrin, thank you for being here on behalf of America's Steelworkers. We do such great work in the steel manufacturing sector, one of the most important sectors to our economy and national security. Of course, having loopholes in Buy America provisions do not benefit the taxpayer, nor the businesses and industries these provisions seek to benefit. But it also undermines the various rules and regulations industry must adhere to, from environmental to worker protections. And critical to this conversation, we must recognize that they aren't extraterritorial. China's steel companies do not adhere to U.S. regulations. So when DOT policies allow the purchase of foreign steel, we undermine these very regulations and subject our own companies and workers to unfair playing field at the taxpayer's expense, no less. It's been said a lot today, but I think we can all benefit if we get Buy America right. Without closing Buy America loopholes or streamlining regulations, only our competitors like China seek to benefit. Ms. Salrin, you mentioned in your testimony that a January 2023 poll conducted by Morning Consult identified that 83% of Republican, Democrat, and independent voters agree that taxpayer dollars should go toward infrastructure projects that utilize America-made products like iron, steel, and other construction materials versus products that are imported from foreign countries. So Ms. Salrin, do, how do we achieve this consensus in Washington? Is it the Buy America loopholes that are in the way, or is it something else? Thank you for your question, and you hit on some very, very important points. Um, I will note that voters are sometimes way ahead of policymakers, mostly because they see firsthand how deindustrialization or how a bridge made of Chinese steel can impact them, them as workers, but also their communities. And so, um, the hollowing out of our industrial base is not a Republican or Democratic issue. It's everyone's issue, and we must address that. Um, we also need strong steel sector for our national defense and to independently build our infrastructure without being reliant on potential hostile or unreliable trading partners. And so Buy America is a bipartisan policy, um, and we need to keep it that way, and we need to make sure that the implementation um, in the administration is robust and strong and ensures that um, no new loopholes are created. Thank you. You may be aware of the I-5 interstate bridge which crosses the Columbia River and is a major transportation connection between Oregon and Washington State. It has been undergoing major repairs but also delays for replacement in the infrastructure. We are all haunted by the San Francisco-Oakland Bay Bridge replacement project a decade ago where California turned Chinese steel to help to repair that bridge. Again, this in no way benefits American steel manufacturers. So how do we ensure this doesn't happen again? And to add to that, how do we prevent federal and state governments turning to foreign products and steel to help repair this I-5 bridge? Yes, so the San Francisco to Oakland Bay Bridge is honestly the, without a doubt, the epitome of bad Buy America loopholes. Um, that project was a product of a segmentation loophole, which allowed California to use state dollars um, to go ahead with the project, benefiting not only um, Chinese manufacturers, but Chinese workers as well, um, and leaving American workers out, out, uh, out of the, the equation. Um, and that project ended up being way over budget and way past due. Um, and so we learned a lot of lessons. Um, and in the 2015 FAST Act, that loophole was closed. And so um, to remain vigilant, I think, for your project, and, and thank you for supporting that, um, we need to make sure that no new loopholes are created. Um, and I'll also highlight that the state of Oregon has implemented by State Buy America policy, which will allow um, stronger Buy America policy used with state and local funds. Um, and so thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Needham, it's my understanding that demand for domestically produced steel will likely increase in response to the recent implementation of the 
Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, the Inflation Reduction Act, and the CHIPS Act. In fact, I've seen some estimates that steel demand is projected to increase by five to eight million tons annually as a result of uh, these pieces of legislation. So given the likely increases in demand, does the domestic steel industry have enough capacity to supply federally funded highway and transit projects, as well as other infrastructure projects like the I-5 bridge that may be subject to the Buy America uh, requirements? And my, your time is limited, I'm over, so if you could answer that very quickly, I'd appreciate yes, it. Yes, thank you for that question. As I mentioned, the uh, uh, U.S. steel industry is about 76% capacity utilization, so we have the capacity to supply those. And also, the other thing that I mentioned earlier, Buy America, what it allows is for um, the uh, confidence to invest in the future. You know, we just uh, um, started a new plate mill in Brandenburg, Kentucky, that is capable of supplying those types of projects. Thank you, Mr. Newman. Thank you. The gentleman's time expired. Mr. Burchett. I'm sorry, it is Mr. Kane. My bad. Thank you, thank you Mr. Chairman. Uh, and thank you for our witnesses being here today. Mr. Enders, you mentioned in your testimony that reclaimed asphalt pavement is a big part of the asphalt industry's focus on sustainability. Can you share more about that effort and why exempting asphalt uh, binder is such a key necessity to incorporate? I know that New Jersey is not, isn't using as much, uh, as, uh, as, as much of it as it should, but it sounds like it would help and utilize current products uh, and materials already in circulation while maintaining performance. Yes, I mean, reclaimed asphalt pavement, um, currently we're recycling over 90 million tons of asphalt pavement. I mean, we're estimating that that's saving over $3 billion in costs for new asphalt pavement. And part of it is we can continue to recycle it. It goes back down, we can recycle it again. And so in areas, like New Jersey, where, where you have an abundance of, of reclaimed asphalt pavement, being able to insert that into your current asphalt mixes could provide both savings and, and it keeps materials out of the landfill. Thank you. Um, Director Braceros, in your testimony, you talk about the, the difficulties in securing Buy America waivers. Congress wanted to make it difficult to attain a waiver, but not impossible. What recommendations do you have to improve the Buy America waiver process? Thank you very much. I think fundamentally I agree. It shouldn't be easy to do and waivers should be limited. And if you look at what's going on right now, they are limited right now. But there needs to be less of a wait time. There needs to be more of an understanding of how long the process will take. We need to have clear guidance on what is expected in terms of documentation to justify a waiver. A waiver. And so if those three things are implemented, I think we can meet the goal of not having many waivers, but also giving a path forward, because this is a pretty time-sensitive element for us. If, if you heard um, Mr. Edmondson's testimony, when a contractor is preparing a bid, they're getting quotes from suppliers for all different types of things. And it's a short bid time. You know, it could be four-week time period at which they're trying to get those prices locked down. And to be able to know that they're working off of products that are meet the qualifications is critical. Otherwise, they're going to add risk to their bid, which costs the taxpayers more money. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Needham, while the DOT has been implementing Buy America policy for decades, IIJA expanded the application of those requirements to components and products that had previously been exempted. This expanded funding has led to other cabinet agencies, like the Department of Treasury, Interior, or HUD, attempting to adhere to Buy American guidelines that may have previously been unknown to them. Obviously, steel is used across all sorts of federal products. Has there been consistency of implementation of Buy America provisions across the federal government? No, there hasn't been consistency. In fact, HUD is, has delayed implementation um, to August of this year for several programs um, on iron and steel products. It's also um, delayed until next year, the implementation for um, 
uh, construction materials and manufa manufactured products in a couple programs. So what I would say to that is a great example of it is the Federal Highway Administration and how they've administered this. And I think, you know, as we look at within our company of how we look at best practices, I think that would be a great way for other agencies to look at them and see how they've implemented it. Okay, and if you're looking as that example, and uh, if you mentioned HUD, for example, and as one, as one of the people who've delayed the implementation, what impact does that have on society and inflation co very costs if these things are delayed? So what it, what it does is it encourages uh, foreign products to come in when we can supply it here domestically um, very easily. And actually, I mean, you're moving products from all over the world, so the costs are or absolutely would be higher. Now, some of them you're not dealing with, um, you know, free market considerations, but, um, you know, certainly it's bringing products, shipping them from all over the world, not great for the environment, not great for um, our building our products or our projects here. Okay. Thank you. Yield back. Gentleman yields, Ms. Malloy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Braceros, good to see you. You said when you started your testimony that American money should be spent on American stuff to benefit Americans, to which I say amen. Um, but it, I've been sitting here listening, and it sounds like we have a tension between two problems with spending American money to benefit Americans. We want to build American by American with American steel. But if waivers take a long time or if products can't be found, then projects get more expensive, and taxpayers are paying for that too. And those are American dollars. Um, and so I just want to know, is, is there an area in particular where Build America, Buy America requir requirements create a particular challenge? Because we keep hearing that DOT is the gold standard. Um, and if everybody could do it the way you do it, it would work better. But, but you're saying there are still challenges. What area can we help you with? Thank you. You, uh, you actually hit the nail on the, the hammer on the nail. And it's, that's one of the challenges we have with this program. We're trying to accomplish a couple of very worthy goals with the same tool. And so it requires a little bit of, um, I say, flexibility and adaptability in terms of how we get there. You know, we want to grow the manufacturing base. We want to imp improve jobs for Americans. Um, but we also want to deliver the projects that save lives and make people's lives better. And so that's, that's a, a little bit of a tension that exists in, try, in trying to achieve those two worthy goals. Um, the, ch the challenge we're, we experience right now with uh, Build America, Buy America is in, like I said earlier, it's the very small, represents a very small percentage of our projects. But it's those elements that have to be part of that project in order to complete it successfully. And so I really think from, you know, even from a federal highway perspective, because they, they've been doing this for a long time, I think they do a great job, um, but it's better understanding what goes into these jobs? What are those elements that are a challenge to meet the Buy America, Build America? And then trying to figure out what kind of market incentives can we provide to help develop those, um, those companies that will build those products in this country. And part of this is companies need to know that this is not just a five-year program. This is something that we're committed to for the long time because if a business is gonna grow, it's gonna to wanna to make an investment for 50 years, for 75 years. And so the long-term signals that Congress can send, I think are really important to help us get to that, where we get to 100% on Build America by America. Thank you. Mr. Needham, you represent the, the business side of this. Um, do you have anything to add to that? Yes, I think that uh, putting a process in place to really um, nailed down to and narrowly defined what are the pain points. And I think that's a, a great example that Mr. Braceris talked about is what are those actual items? Because I think from a, a iron and steel standpoint, we've been implementing this for quite a while. Um, I'm not aware of major pain points. What, what I think is we need a robust process to be able to bring those to the forefront and review them quickly. And that's what's needed. And, and that works certainly from our perspective um, when we have the 15-day review and we can give a, a great example of are we capable of producing that here or not. And the exceptions to that are very few. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Edmondson, do you have anything to add? 
I agree with that. The earlier we can define what those pain points are, the better off we all are. And I think that's the key. And, and open communication, the collaboration between the industry, the manufacturing capacity, the, the uh, funding, all of that needs to work together to, to improve that process. Thank you. Mr. Enders, in the few seconds I have left, is there anything you want to say that they haven't already covered? I think they covered what I was thinking. Okay. Thank you all for being here. Mr. Chair, I yield back. Gentleman yields, Mr. Graves. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank all of you for being here today. Um, Mr. Um, Edmondson, I'm from Louisiana. We, we have um, spent an extraordinary amount of money trying to build roads and water resource uh, resiliency type projects. Over the past few years, I, I watch these projects very closely. I've seen routinely as projects are coming in 40% <clears throat> to on the high end, 300%, 300% over initial project estimate. Um, <clears throat> so I get my singing voice back here. Um, are you seeing similar uh, outcomes uh, from the projects that, that you're involved in? We have seen an increase. A lot of it was supply, supply chain related. Supply chain, labor, inflation, all those things. Yeah. We, together. we are st seeing the supply chain issues. Um, they're, they're, um, they're improving. We've seen that happen over the last 18 months. Are, are, there, are um, the estimates that I've given, are those out of bounds compared to what, what you've seen in, in projects? I think over the past four to five years, we've seen that kind of increase. Uh, thank you. Um, uh, Mr. Uh, Braceras, um, are, are you seeing the similar types of outcomes and are you being challenged in implementation as well? Y yes, we are. I can't say it's, you know, Build America, Buy America is not... No, the, no, I'm, I'm, yeah. uh, labor, oh. supply chain, inflation, yep. just oh. the cumulative yeah. effect. As an, ex as a, an example, in 2021, we saw a 60... Maybe I'll start. We have our five-year, what we call state transportation implementation program, STIP. That's our little transportation nerdiness. Uh, that's about $5 billion for the state of Utah. The federal portion makes up about 20, 20 and a half percent of that total program. We normally program in for the cash flow, 5% increase in projects a year. Mm. In 2021, we saw a 16% increase. In 2022, that was a 12% increase. In 2023, we were at 8%. So we're starting to come back down, but you can imagine the inflationary impact that's had to our entire well, program. But, but when you say come back down, you mean the rate of growth. The rate of growth, yeah. exactly. Exactly. No, price, and I, <laughs> I keep reminding my, my legislators at home, Prices probably are not going back to where they were before, but the rate of growth is starting to come back down into something that we could better manage. So, so when, I, when I do some quick math ba based upon the numbers that you've thrown out and, and based upon what we've seen at home, there, there was a lot of excitement that the infrastructure bill was going to come in and provide all of these uh, additional or, or um, excess supplemental funds. And, and based on what we're seeing at home, it is more than being consumed uh, based upon the supply chain, the labor, inflation, and other other impacts and costs, are, are you seeing similar outcomes? Me, me? Yeah. yeah, sorry. Uh, I just say thank God for IIJA. You know that increase was just critical for us to be able to help absorb these changes. This was, I've seen increases like this before, leading up to the 2008 um, crash that we had. And at that time, we saw up to 20% increase in project costs. But, but based but, upon the additional funds that were included in IIJA, what we're seeing at home is that we're actually, we're, we're, the, the, the additional funds are being eaten up by the, by the higher costs. There, are you seeing similar? Yes, the, the, for, the formula program, mm -hmm. which is what we rely on, yep. that's the sure. foundation for us, is we're, we're not even quite break even. Yeah, um, so there's not extra. The discretionary program is obviously the sugar on top. Yeah. And uh, that could be more, but that's that's not, you can't really plan for things on the discretionary program. Yeah. That's yeah. a one off. Sure, sure. Yeah, well, I think we're seeing similar things at home and, and, and obviously need to figure out how to address this. And I'll, I'll say it again, I think it's a cumulative effect, the inflation, the labor supply chain, and and, and other factors. Um, Ms. Sauron, I'm, I'm, Look, want to be very clear. I think everybody here, we certainly are, are very uh, supportive of 
uh, of, of buy American and want to use as many American products as, as we can in everything that we do. Um, but I also have pretty extraordinary frustration looking at these Buy America standards that are being put in place, whether it was for the energy bill or for the infrastructure bill, and, and not having anywhere near the supply chain that's needed. And so we've seen on EV charging stations that hasn't even been built yet, uh, that they just did a blanket waiver. Congress tried to step in and stop that, and the administration uh, blocked us. Uh, how do you feel about this, this uh, basically invitation to bring in all these foreign products whenever the, the goal was to ensure that we had U.S. labor, U.S. products? I will note that the, um, the EV charger waiver is an implementing policy, and it allows for critical capacity to get build up over time since we didn't have any. But if I recall correctly, isn't it a five-year waiver? No, implementation goes in full effect in July of this year. But, but I thought, I might be misremembering, but I thought that the waiver that they did gave a five-year waiver um, for the charging stations. The 55% domestic content right. for EV chargers goes in effect July of 2024. Okay, maybe I need to go back and figure out what I'm... Happy to provide there. that information, yeah. yeah, for sure. So, so what about, I mean, just the fact that here we are uh, years later and, and we're, we're not even building it, it, it seems like the, oh, sorry, Mr. Chairman, I'll wrap. Um, I'll, I'll just close and say this, and, and maybe I'll offer some questions for the record. The, the regulatory agenda that we're seeing just doesn't see, com, seem compatible with the implementation agenda, and that here we are years later and we still have 80% of the money in the bank from the, from the infrastructure program, which is incredibly frustrating, I know, to me. But, uh, Mr. Chairman, I apologize for going over. I yield back. No problem. Gentleman yields. Are there any other members that haven't been recognized? Seeing none, that concludes our hearing for today. I want to thank each of the witnesses for your testimony. Thank you again for being here today. The committee stands adjourned.